Yeah, where is it? Thank you all for being here today. It's a great honor for you to share your personal stories of struggle under the enormous strain imposed on you by the very, very failed and failing Obamacare law. Secretary Price and I, along with my entire administration, and a lot of people in the Senate and a lot of people in the House, are committed to repealing and replacing this disastrous law with a health care plan that lowers cost, expands choice, and ensures access for everyone. You represent the millions of Americans who have seen their Obamacare premiums increase by double digit and even triple digits. In Arizona, the rates are over 116 percent last year. 116 percent increase. And the deductibles are so high, you don't even get to use it. Many Americans lost their plans and doctors altogether in one third of the counties. Think of it, one third only have one insurer left. I mean, the insurance companies are fleeing. They're gone. So many gone. The House bill to repeal and replace Obamacare will provide you and your fellow citizens with more choices, far more choices, at lower cost. Americans should pick the plan they want. Now they'll be able to pick the plan they want. They'll be able to pick the doctor they want. They'll be able to do a lot of things that the other plan was supposed to give and it never gave. You don't pick your doctor, you don't pick your plan, you remember that one. We're not going to have one size fits all. Instead, we're going to be working to unleash the power of the private marketplace to let insurers come in and compete for your business. And you'll see rates go down, 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 and you'll see plans go up, up, up. You have a lot of choices. You'll have plans that nobody's even thinking of today. They will have plans that today nobody has even thought about because the market's going to enforce that with millions and millions of people wanting health care. More competition and less regulation will finally bring down the cost of care, and I think it'll bring it down very significantly. Unfortunately, it takes a while to get there because you have to let that marketplace kick in, and it's going to take a little while to get there. Once it does, it's going to be a thing of beauty. I wish it didn't take a, a year and two years, but that's what's going to happen, and that's the way it works. But uh, we're willing to go through that process. Working together, we'll get the job done. And I have to say this just in closing, and then I want to hear some of your stories, and we'll let the press stay for your stories, if you like. But the press is making Obamacare look so good all of a sudden. I'm watching the news. Look so good. They're showing these reports about this one gets so much and this one gets so much. First of all, it covers very few people, and it's imploding. And 17 will be the worst year. And I said it once, I'll say it again, because Obama's gone. He, you know, he, it, things are going to be very bad this year for the people with Obamacare. They're going to have tremendous increases. And the Republicans, frankly, are putting themselves in a very bad position. I tell this to Tom Price all the time, by repealing Obamacare. Because people aren't going to see the truly devastating effects of Obamacare. They're not going to see the devastation in 17 and 18 and 19, it'll be gone by then. It'll, whether we do it or not, it'll be imploded off the map. So the press is making it look so wonderful so that if we end it, everyone's going to say, oh, remember how great Obamacare used to be. Remember how wonderful it used to be. It was so great. It's a little bit like President Obama. When he left, people liked him. When he was here, people didn't like him so much. That's the way life goes. That's human nature. The fact is, Obamacare is a disaster. And by, and I say this to the Republicans all the time, by repealing it, by getting rid of it, by ending it, everyone's going to say, oh, it used to be so great. But it wasn't great. And I tell Tom Price, and I tell Paul Ryan, I tell every one of them, I say the best thing you can do politically is wait a year, because it's going to blow itself off the map. But that's the wrong thing to do for the country. It's the wrong thing to do for our citizens. So with that, I'd like to introduce some of the folks, and you could say a few words about your experience with Obamacare, and perhaps the press will even report it. Would you like to start? Yeah, thank you Good. for this opportunity, thank you. Mr. President. 
Thank you. Our rates are three times they were before Obamacare started. Uh, we have one provider in our county. We have very little options for what we can and cannot do. We're a small business owner. We're actually not a brick and mortar. We are cattle ranchers. We can't afford our equipment if we're paying these rates year after year after year. Our food source is in jeopardy because of this health care law. It's my basic. I know. It's all right. No worries. No worries. This is what's happening. It's gone up three times, and then you have to pay. If you don't want to use it, you have to pay. That's the, the all-time beauty. If you don't want to use it, you have to pay. And Tom, you have to pay big league, right? It's so people say, well, if I use it, I use it. I'm paying too much. If I don't use it, I have to pay a penalty. And do you ever pay penalties? Do you ever do that, or you have to? We haven't as of yet, but we were uninsured in December. They dropped us for the fourth time after we paid over $50,000 last year for health care expenses. And it's gone up triple. Yes. And before Obamacare, you actually had good health care. We did. Yeah. We had a fantastic A lot of people. Plan. Nobody ever takes that into account. I'm not saying the system before was good, because it wasn't. But millions of people had great health care that they loved. Now, when you start deducting those millions of people from the so-called people that are happy, you have a very small number of people that are happy. That I can tell you. How about you? Well, we're kind of the same story as Carrie. In 2009, I left a full-time job to be a stay-at-home mom to two kids. For our family, it was never an option to get government assistance. We just don't believe our neighbors should work harder so that we don't have to. So my husband said, if you can pay for our insurance, which at the time was $650 a month for private health insurance for a family of four, then that was fine. From 2009 to 2015, that private insurance went up by 102%. Um, finally, his employer told us in 2015, when it went up the final time, an additional 34%, that they couldn't carry our family anymore. So I had to enter back into the workforce, but I couldn't find a job that offered health insurance. So we entered the under Obamacare, and we believe the sales pitch that if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Mm -hmm. So even though we we're going to have to pay $1,300 a month for Obamacare, we thought we'd still be okay with our doctors. We were on it for five months. Our pediatrician for our children wouldn't take it. My doctor wouldn't take it. So we paid him $8,000 in five months and were never, never able to use it. And I think what makes our family story unique is we're by no means wealthy. In 2014, when we entered the exchange, we made $53,000 as a family. My husband and I together, that was our gross income. And then in 2015, we made together, since I'd gone back to work, $74,000. But when you look at paying $10,000 in health premiums and insurance and health costs, you know. So it's been a rough job. It has. It's been hard. And how have you found Obamacare? Uh, it, I, I will be so happy to see it gone. Um, I mean, I just, it's, it's almost put our family in financial ruin, and I think that's the story for a lot of people. It's put businesses today. in financial ruin. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's one of the biggest costs. It has been disastrous for mm -hmm. businesses. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, First of all, Mr. President, thank you for, for having you. us here. Thank you. I think it's a great opportunity uh, to tell the, the, the American people, people like ourselves that have uh, struggled with, uh, with the, with the health care law. Uh, I myself am from Miami. I uh, haven't had very much time to prepare, but uh, um, you know, the President of the United States calls and I'm here. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just, it just so happened I had. Uh, Every single year, for the past couple of years, I've had uh, uh, a different insurance every single year. Before, I, I had an individual plan, my wife and I, my wife is an attorney, I'm a computer programmer, I'm a small business, my wife is a small business, and um, I, I just don't understand what happened. You know, we, uh, we have, I have a daughter with a disability, We've changed our plan every year. We the insurance our... was good before Obamacare. Oh, absolutely. I was never. I never many had... people are like that. Many, many plans were great before Obamacare. Yeah. They were so happy, and that doesn't justify a system before Obamacare. But people are miserable now, and it's putting people out of business. Yeah. It's putting them in the poorhouse. Go ahead. It's it's just that uh, we had to. Ch they canceled our plans. And I couldn't understand why they canceled our plan. So we had no other choice. Uh, I remember the President of the United States say that individual plans will not be covered. You either have to have an employer-based plan 
if you, I do not work for the government. I do not work for a large employer. It's very unfair. Um, we are the, we are ground zero. Um, my case is ground zero for the uh, health care law. And you represent a lot of people in the same situation. Absolutely. It's very unfair. Right, my friend right. here, she, she's in the same situation. And uh, I think it's very, very unfair. And uh, I think that what the real scenario was that this law was supposed to implode, like you were saying. Right. Um, and my parents are from, uh, you know, came from communist Cuba. They know what socialism is all about. So I know what socialism is, and that's pretty much what was, what's this, you know, this whole system was meant to have one single uh, provider. Well, it turns out so expensive, it's almost not socialism when you think of it. Right. <laughs> you pay so much. What do you think? Go ahead. Um, I'm from Arizona, and I can tell you that the 116% increase is real. It's not a myth. Um, I lost my plan three times during the, the Obamacare era. Um, after losing it this year, I decided to opt out. So right now, I do not have traditional health care. And I was went from a $365 a month um, premium last year to a $809 premium this year. And a higher deductible. The deductible was going to be $6,800, no co-pays. Right. So if I went to the doctor, I would be paying out of my pocket. And it just didn't seem like a good use of my money. I felt like I would be a better steward of that $17,000 at the end of the year should I have reached my deductible and just decided to opt out. I went into a faith-based share program and I'm doing that. One of the reasons I felt like I can do this, you know, you totally are taking a leap of faith, right. um, is because I think, I know, you're going to get this taken care of. So I thought it's only going to be for a year. I will be on my th this program. I will opt out of traditional health care for health insurance, and I, I think you're going to get it done. You have a lot of people in Arizona paying a big penalty? Um, yes. You're and, paying the penalty. Well, and my husband also owns his own business and doesn't, um, can't afford to offer insurance to his employees, and his employees who are, you know, also in the independent market, um, it's, just, it's just getting too much. And I've had individual insurance for 25 years, since I started my business. So I've always been in that individual market. I've always done what was right, you know. Take, you know, I took responsibility for myself, made sure I was covered for healthcare, because I'm a business person. I don't want any, you know, huge um, healthcare expenses to affect, you know, the money, you know, that could be going to my business now having to go to a health expense. So I, you know, I was, a, you know, in my mid 20s when I said, you know what, I've got to get. We've always got to get square with this. I'd have to have insurance, so I have. Well, thank you very Until much. Until this year. The people of Arizona have been hit very, very hard, at least 116%. Here's the bad news. It's going to go up more this year. Now, if we repeal it, nobody's going to know that. Yeah. And the press is going to say how wonderful it was. <laughs> and, uh, gee, we miss Obamacare. That's the problem. It's the biggest problem I have, Tom. Exactly. We're going to do them a big favor, but it's... Uh, not the right way. Go ahead. Mr. President, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, my name is Louis Brown. Uh, I work for the Christ Medicus Foundation, an attorney by training. Uh, in 2009, when the Affordable Care Act was going through Congress, what became the Affordable Care Act, I was working for the Democratic National Committee at the time. I resigned my position because I, I could tell that the Democratic bill that was going through Congress wanted to publicly fund abortion, and that's not something that I could go along with. So I resigned my position. Later worked for Congressman Dan Lundgren uh, in Congress mm -hmm. and went on to eventually work for the Christ Medicus Foundation. We're focused on building a culture of life, uh, protecting religious liberty and health care, protecting the right of conscience, prohibiting the public funding of abortion, and also prohibiting non-discrimination against pro-life medical mm -hmm. providers. Um, I, you know, especially as an African American, I'm a graduate of Howard University School of Law. Good school. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I know from St. John Paul II, he, he said that uh, the, the, all of our human and civil rights that we believe in as Americans, that we share as Americans, the right to, 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 to health care, the right to medical care, to housing, to all these different things, are illusory if the right to life isn't defended with maximum determination. 17 million African Americans, it's shown, that probably have been aborted since Roe v. Wade. And I supported you in the presidential election. Thank you. Uh, gave several speeches in Michigan uh, telling folks to vote pro-life in the general election. 
and really happy that you're here to, 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 to continue the bipartisan belief that there should be no taxpayer funding of abortion, and also really to support your effort to show that the patient, the human person, should be at the center of our American health care system, not the government. The government has its place, but the patient should be the center. So I'm happy to support you, Mr. Thank President. you. That's so nice. Liz. Thank you. I appreciate sure. it. Great job. Yes, go ahead. Mr. President, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. My name is Dr. Manny, and I run a nonprofit uh, called Healthy Tennessee uh, in, uh, across Tennessee. I'm a trauma surgeon. But what we do I'll is. We'll be in Tennessee on Wednesday. We look forward to hosting. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll see you there. Yes, sir. Uh, we do these large community events where, uh, in rural Appalachia, across Tennessee, where we host these health fairs taking care of patients. So it's really a grassroots effort, something that you understand better than anybody, where people come out just to help people uh, doctors, nurses on the ground helping folks with preventative medicine, educating folks. Uh, that's what we do. But the one thing I've been seeing across Tennessee is that folks uh, really can't afford these rising premiums. So what they're doing is, effectively, they're paying the tax penalty, and they're not, because it's cheaper and it works out better than paying for the, uh, for the insurance. And so that's been a big problem that we're seeing across the state. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, uh, to tackle this problem. So you've seen a big problem, and the way out of the problem is to do a plan much more like the plan we're going to get done. Yes, sir. We will yes, get sir. that out. We yes, sir. That out. Without penalties, too, by the way. People don't mention all of the facts. You know, the other thing about what we're talking about, we really have a three-phase plan. They only want to talk about the first phase. The first phase is just the most basic of phases. And then you have phase two, which is largely done by our secretary, and then you have phase three, which is a lot of the bells and whistles, but they don't want to talk about the bells and whistles. So they're really comparing things to something that won't be there for long. And the reason we have to do it that way is because of Congress. I'd love to do it all in one package, but if you did it that way, it can't get done. So uh, we're going to get something done that's going to be terrific. I appreciate it. Thank you, Doctor, very much. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I, too, am from Tennessee, and I, too, am in the farming industry. And, uh, the effect that I've had through Obamacare is my wife and my daughter's insurance is supplied through her work. I buy my own. And uh, I've seen the increases since Obamacare to the tune of about $5,000 a year just for me. And I'm considering taking the option of, of the penalty to because my problem with the penalty is, though, if I opt out of the program and buy a private plan, just a catastrophic plan because I'm a very healthy man, if I take that option, not only is my income uh, penalized, but my wife's income as well, who makes considerable more money than I do, but she has insurance. So I don't think that's fair, and I I don't think the, 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 the rate increase is just astronomical, and I'm in the county that only has one option. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, and I've got about a $540 a month premium for the $7,000 out-of-pocket deductible before I see any help at all. And I either got to pay a high premium for a plan that I don't need or don't want. Will you be able to continue in the years to come if you have to keep going like this? They're dropping out every day, the, the, the suppliers in every county. There's 35 counties in Tennessee that has no option at all right now. I don't know what those folks do. You know what that means. That means somebody's going to make a lot of money. You know that. They're going to make they a lot of money. <laughs> somebody's, well, a few. You're yes. not going to make. They're going to make. Yes. There are people, that, there are people very happy about your situation. Thank you for the opportunity. To be well, I appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Doctor? Yes, sir. Well, I'm a, a physician in Texas, and thank you for allowing me to be here today. And thank I'll you. tell you, what I've seen is that a lot of patients really are not adequately covered by Obamacare. It was supposed to cover people, but like everyone has said here, with, with the rising premiums and, and the rising deductibles, I take care of patients in the hospital, and patients are shocked to get uh, a, a $20,000 bill and to find that they're responsible for 6000 of that because their deductible is so high. And that's just a situation that, that cannot continue. Um, Medicaid expansion um, under Obamacare really doesn't cover folks either because many physicians are not even taking Medicare. They're not accepting it any longer in the outpatient setting. And so folks who have chronic medical illnesses like, like cancer, my, my wife is a breast cancer survivor, 
and most of her treatment was actually as an outpatient. It was very expensive outpatient care. Most physicians don't even accept Medicaid, so those patients are still uncovered. Right. And so the Medicaid expansion really hasn't covered them. The folks who have Obamacare insurance really are inadequately covered as well because they're still paying extremely high premiums and then having to pay extremely high deductibles. And so it's really And do they even reach patients. it with the high deductibles? They don't even reach it. You, you know, oftentimes they do not unless they have some sort of serious medical problem and they're in the hospital right. and it's very expensive. They, they don't even reach their deductible oftentimes. And so it's unfortunate. And so I, I really appreciate it. I, I um, um, actually, actually read the bill that that that, that that's been produced. Uh, that's that's coming out of the house now, and and I really like a lot of the changes in it. I think that it's going to correct a lot of uh, a lot of the issues that Obamacare has had. So I, I really appreciate what you all well, are I doing. I appreciate it, Doctor. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Say hello to your wife. Yes, sir. Very nice. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Gia. Hi, Mr. President. I'm Gina. I'm from Wisconsin. I'm a nurse. I'm a mom, and I am part of that huge group of middle class families that were impacted by the ACA. Um, before ACA, we had insurance that was eventually canceled, and I had written a letter to our senator just asking him, what do I do? Do I quit my job completely so that we can obtain a subsidy, a job that I love as a nurse and a hospital that I love? Um, or do I uproot my family and try to find a job with <coughs> benefits um, that doesn't even cover the medical. Med so the health care, the, the Obamacare, forced you to actually, in a sense, forces you economically and almost potentially to get another job. Right. Even though you like your job. Right. That's so I, I did end up getting a higher, a full time position at the hospital that I worked at. Um, but that came with a price because I was working three days a week and spending time with my small children, who are my number one priority. Right. And after the ACA, I was forced because we could not afford a premium of $1,200 per month and deductible that didn't cover anything um, to find Meaning a job. Meaning the deductible was so high that essentially, right. unless you had a really big problem, you wouldn't even be able to use it. Correct, yes. And we're still in that boat. I mean, right now our deductible is $6,500. And so if I have a child who's extremely sick, it's going to cost me hundreds of dollars. Um, yeah. Just last week, my daughter had a fever, and I sent her to school for three days straight because I had to work to afford our insurance, and I couldn't afford to bring her to the doctor. So it has been devastating for our family. It's really not having insurance at all. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of Obamacare, you don't really have insurance mm -hmm. because the deductibles are so high that you really don't have insurance, mm -hmm. if you think about it. All right. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Well, yes, sir. President, thank you, you very much for hosting us. Thank you, Greg. I have to start with something. As I was leaving the house, my 11-year-old ran up to me and said, Dad, I'd like to give, have you give this to Mr. President for me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have that. Well, I, just, I wish I was so handsome. handsome with that, I, I wish I looked back. that good. <laughs> Dear President Trump, it is a great honor to be able to write to the President of the USA. I think you're a great President and a great man. Also, don't worry, the picture of you on the front of this looks nothing like you. That's very nice. I wish I looked that good. Yeah. Sorry thank about you. The hair. All we have is arms. Well, thank you, boy. <laughs> so I had the privilege of meeting with uh, Secretary Price and Vice President Pence in Cincinnati uh, about a week and a half ago at a round table, and I'll share with you what I shared with them. I started with uh, a quote from the great President Ronald Reagan, who said uh, the most terrifying words in the English language are, we're from the government and we're here to help. Uh, kind of my feeling on health care. Frankly, I think that the system was broken before the last administration got their hands on it. I started my company 21 years ago, and I had a, a, a vision of wanting to provide 100% full family health care for as long as I had a company, because I really felt in my heart that it was the right thing to do. I was one of the last holdouts, but sadly, after about 15 years, I really had a choice of either having a company or being able to provide my employees that level of health care. And that's sad. You know, I, I tell my wife all the time, you can have anything you want. We just can't have everything we want. We have the best health care system in the world. We do. But it needs to be fixed. What small business owners like myself, and I'm, I'm, I'm a manufacturer, I'm on several boards in the Midwest in manufacturing, what we'd like to see is not a, a government-operated market, but a free market. You know, 
I sell capital sure. equipment for a living. We have a, a, a trade show every year, and there's hundreds and hundreds of people selling competitive products. If we had a healthcare show in my town, there'd be three or four people under that roof. And as a businessman yourself, you know what that does to, to driving down cost or the lack thereof. Right, right. So we would like to see more of a free market solution, going back to what made this country great. You know, entrepreneurialism instead of empowerments, work ethics instead of welfare. And that's what we'd like to ask you for. And I'd like to say well, that's, you know, that's what we're doing largely, but we also have to take care of people that can't afford to be in Absolutely. a position like you are. So uh, we're going to do that largely. I, you know, I think beyond everything, uh, if you look at what's going to happen, the competitive bidding and everything. every element of what we're doing is competitive bidding. But we have to take care of people who need the help. I totally and there agree. are a lot of people like that. There's always and been a safety net in the United it's States, be. and there should it's be. Unfortunately, be. when I see 50,000 or 50 million Americans taking, you know, assistance in, in you know, their marketing, right. food stamps. Right. That's like, you know, for the people who really can't provide for themselves, you know, we're all charitable people. We're Americans. We're the most generous nation on the face of the earth. So I totally believe in, in safety nets for those who need them. Not free handouts for the We're going to help a lot of people, but we are going to be very much free market. People that can afford it will go out and they'll be off yep. the cost. Go ahead, Stan. I'm Commissioner Stan Summers from Box Hill County, Northern Utah. I think I'm probably the only other elected official here besides you guys. Um, it's been an interesting ride to watch the healthcare system in the last 26 years when my son was born. He was three and a half months premature um, 26 years ago, and we had really good insurance. Um, we basically didn't have to pay anything out of pocket besides what we were doing, you know, from where I worked. As time went on, you know, you could kind of tell the healthcare system has been a little bit broke, a little bit broke, and then all of a sudden the ACA, and I'm not going to call it the other word, I call it the last president's healthcare program. I don't want to even say say that name. So anyway, other it was that you like them a lot. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's got to the point where I own a couple businesses too and do the things that I have to do. I actually ran for government so I could have insurance and won. But now I'm, now I'm looking at these people saying, how can I provide insurance for them without raising taxes and doing these things that are happening? Right. Because everything's going up. Utah didn't expand Medicaid. We weren't a part of, it, a part of that. And we can see why now, because of the things that are happening throughout the nation with states and companies and everybody Absolutely. else going bankrupt. So it got to the point where I ended up, not only with my businesses, had to drive school bus to keep my wife at home with my kid that was, that was ill. So now I own three businesses, I drive school bus, and I'm an elected official to be able to continue to do the things I need to do with health care. The last three, well, the last three years. So it's gone through the roof. Oh, I've got a $6,000 deductible, HSA, but I will meet that again in three months. So I'm at 40, I think my wife said this morning at 48 or 4,900 bucks already this year in March to be able to meet my out-of-pocket maximum. Wow. And so by the time April comes, I would have met that to be able to get, continue to do. And if there was one thing I probably could ask you about, and my, and my boy's got a rare disease, and I, I appreciate you talking about the rare, rare community in your speeches, is that if somebody has cancer or somebody has a rare disease or continues to have problems, why do we have to do a deductible every year? I mean, so I'm sitting there at Christmas going, okay, my deductible's been met for six or eight months, and I'm gonna turn around and have to do it again for the same disease, for the same symptoms, yeah. for the same everything. Can I answer that? That'd be interesting. But it, it, it's all about the risk and spreading the risk right. uh, with, with, with insurance over a period of time. It's, uh, but it is a challenge for individuals with, with chronic disease. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Well, and, I, and I appreciate you even thinking about it and talking about grassroots and when you're talking about all the people that we support with the farmers and ranchers and the small business people and the, and the people that are in manufacturing. Our county is one of the largest manufacturing counties in the nation per capita, and Newcore would love to tell you thanks. Newcore Steel would love right. to tell you thanks for everything that you've been doing. Newcore has been very good. It's going to get better. Too. And we've got a ton of those. The space program, we used to make the shuttle. Right. Rocket boosters out at ATK, Morton, and Thaikal. And, you know, we'd love to have the space program. i got a really good friend. Those days are gone, but they're coming back. I've got a friend that's <laughs> going to go up in the next little bit. Lieutenant Commander Scott Maker Tingle is headed up on a spaceship from Russia but he would love to come back to the United States and be able to go up through the United States. So all those jobs I know will come back with you. Well, Gary Cohn, who's sitting right next to you. If there's we're, anything we can do. He's a big believer in what you're saying right there. If there's anything we can do to help you, the counties are behind you, we can find you low-hanging fruit 
to be able to pick off that tree to help Good. with jobs. Just let us know where we can help. Good. Thank you, Stan. Thank you for your time. Would you have anything to say, uh, Tom, generally speaking? Well, I, I, these stories, Mr. President, are really powerful uh, about the consequences of, of uh, the current law. Um, and you hear people's lives that have been affected in, in remarkably adverse ways that sometimes you don't think about as it relates to, to health care, whether it's businesses that haven't been able to survive or individuals who need to take three, four, five jobs, uh, moms that can't, can't be with their kids when they want. Uh, this is about real people. It's about real patients. And so working with you and your leadership, we, we, we are really excited about the opportunity to put in place a patient-centered system where patients and families and doctors are making decisions and not Washington, D.C. What about the concept that, and, and everybody knows it's happening, that Obamacare is imploding, that if we don't do anything, it's not even going to be around in another year. The insurance companies are fleeing. Uh, but now it seems to be getting this wonderful press like it's a wonderful thing. And it's a horrible thing, actually, and getting worse. And 17 will be by far the worst year so far. Yes because a lot of things were put into 17, but 17 is going to be worse, and I assume 18 will be worse even than 17. So it's essentially gone. How do you respond to that? Because I've been telling you, why don't we wait, just let it implode, and let's not take the blame. I've been telling you that as an option. Yeah. It's not an option I like, frankly, but it's certainly an option. <laughs> How do you respond to that? I think 18 can be better if, the, if, if we implement the law and we utilize the regulatory process to make some Well, I'm not changes. saying that. I'm saying if we don't implement the law, what well, happens with Obamacare? What's going on with what Obamacare? You, what you'll see is, is a magnification of all these stories around this table. More businesses being harmed. More individuals not having the kind of income that they, that the disposable income that they would use. More moms and dads not able to care for their kids in the way that they believe to be most appropriate. More people getting insurance, but no, but no care. Uh, this is about real people's lives, and that's why it's so important. Getting insurance, but not being able to use it because the deductibles exactly. are so high. Exactly. I mean, right. you hear these stories where they're paying a fortune for insurance, yeah. and then you hear how high their de deductible is, and unless they have a tragedy in their family, yeah. they're never going to be able to use it. And this fellow has to thirteen thousand dollars before the insurance kicks in. That's what he has to pay. Thirteen thousand yeah. dollars. It's like not having insurance. That's like not having insurance. Yeah. Keep working. They're catastrophic plans now. Exactly. He's been working very hard. And he's doing a great job. Mr. Vice President, do you have anything to say? Well, Mr. President, I think what, I think what uh, these great Americans see in high relief is you're someone who puts people over politics. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank all of them uh, for coming and in, and in front of the national media talking about the real world impacts of Obamacare. You've said it consistently over the last two years that Obamacare has failed. But uh, these people are emblematic of the Americans that that Obamacare has failed, and uh, I just am, am so grateful for their time, but uh, so grateful for your compassionate leadership in, in, in driving the Congress and driving our nation toward uh, better health care outcomes for them and, and better solutions built on those American principles of, of more consumer choices, more free market, but also, as you said, uh, caring for the most vulnerable by allowing our states to innovate in Medicaid in ways that will uh, create even even better a better health care coverage than they have today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. President, do you have any message for people who are concerned about losing their insurance, either through Medicaid or higher costs because they're older? It'll get better. If we're allowed to do what we want to do, it'll get better. Much better. It Hopefully it'll get very good. I'm sure it takes a period of time. It Thank does. You, Thank, Thank, you. Press. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Press. Thank you, Press. Thank you, Thank you, Press. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you, 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 Thank